Welcome to our session, What's New in SQL Tools for Developers. My name is Alan Yu, and I'm a Program Manager at Microsoft. And I'm joined today with Drew Squires Kabala. And today we are excited to share all the latest developments around SQL tooling experiences um, for the developers. Uh, for the agenda today, we're going to start off by talking about graphical tool fundamentals, in particular Visual Studio Code, as well as Azure Data Studio, and as well as diving deep into several areas for SQL developers, such as SQL project support, um, also for the latest in schema deployments, and also how to leverage GitHub Actions for creating database pipelines. So to start off, let's talk about our graphical tools and what does the landscape look like? At the moment, the most popular tools um, that developers are using, it turns out is Visual Studio Code. And you can see that this is held by a very significant margin um, from this year's Stack Overflow developer survey, that Visual Studio Code is the most used IDE um, across all uh, surface areas. And so if we just kind of look at a deeper look into uh, what this looks like for uh, SQL experiences, let's go ahead and pull up Visual Studio Code. And as a developer, in order to get started with uh, your SQL uh, development, um, you'll want to download the MS SQL extension for VS Code, which you can find in the extension marketplace and search for MS SQL. And this will give you the ability to uh, you know, make connections and also run some basic queries um, and also provide you this little icon that would be added to the activity pane here so that you can view the different connections you've connected to um, and also be able to run queries against it. So in the current experience, you can see that um, you know, as a developer, if you wanted to make some really quick connections and run some um, ad hoc queries, um, you can do so uh, through the MS SQL extension here and also see um, any past queries you may have executed in the past. So in this example, I have uh, this select star to select all this customer data and I'll go ahead and execute it, uh, this query and kind of see what the results look like. As you can see, it was updated in our query history and we're just waiting for this to load up here and you can see that there's some really uh, small customer data that is provided here. And this is really, uh, the main experience that you're getting in uh, Visual Studio Code um, if you want to use SQL Server. Like it gives you just enough to be able to do the things that you want. But as soon as you want to do any deeper work, uh, this is where uh, it's going to, there's going to be an ask for uh, more work, especially around database management. Um, and so as a team, we evaluated that a lot of our database developers and database administrators are really looking for richer GUI components. And unfortunately, the current extensibility model in VS Code was a little bit limiting so that we could not fully leverage these capabilities so that we could bring full management capabilities for our customers. And so, you know, after you know, working with the VS Code team, uh, we ended up creating a tool called Azure Data Studio. And essentially, Azure Data Studio is a fork of Visual Studio Code, um, except it allows for greater um, extensibility of richer GUI components that doesn't quite fit the vision for Visual Studio Code. However, you can see right here that already there's a lot of different things to look at. Uh, for example, you have different server groups that you could decide if you want to organize your connections in a certain way. Um, you can also see that there's not separate windows between the query that you want to execute and the results grid. But now you also have different options here that if you want to be able to interact with this data and do something more with it, such as creating a chart with it and you know share this chart out or even add it to this potential dashboard, uh, which is the database uh, dashboard represented here, it can pin these different widgets so that you can um, kind of get some really quick insights into the health of your database. And so, you know, by having this additional um, GUI components, this allows us to have uh, greater management features that you might be familiar with in SQL Server Management Studio. So if we wanted to take a quick peek into some of this, such as in the admin pack for SQL Server, 
Um, this would allow us to be able to get SQL Server Agent, SQL Server Profiler, the Import Flat File Wizard, um, and also the DAC Pack extension. And this could all be used in the context of Azure Data Studio, uh, which currently cannot be fully supported in Visual Studio Code. Um, and so this is kind of where Azure Data Studio has really formed this niche, where you know you have a lot of the benefits of being this tool that's out on GitHub, um, and also uh, you know it works on any plat uh, operating system like uh, Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Um, and yeah, that, that kind of uh, what do you call it? That, that kind of shows the value prop of having all this richer management components. Um, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, one other kind of uh, benefit by for us to take this dependency on Visual Studio Code is that we do get the latest improvements that you may see in each of the monthly uh, releases. And this also includes our support in source control. And so if we go ahead and go to the source control um, extension here and we click clone repository, what we can do here is we could go ahead and find something that's available on GitHub, such as this you know, really great resource called Tiger Toolbox, where our SQL Server team have uploaded all these really amazing uh, SQL scripts so that you can go ahead and use it to um, you know, monitor your database and things like that. And what we'll do here is we'll simply you know, clone and go back to Azure Data Studio and set this as our target. And we'll just wait for some time. Oh, actually we need to quickly set a folder for it. So I will choose Tiger Toolbox. And it'll just take some time right here um, as we uh, load up this repo. And what's really great here is that, you know, this is really great in scenarios where if you want to, um, you know, manage all these different scripts across the team, um, you can have this communication through source control, such as like any changes that you want to go ahead um, and make modifications to, um, or just want to make it so that you know it's really easy for other people to just simply clone all the different scripts that you have, um, and that's kind of the benefits uh, that you're able to see there. So, I and perfect, we now have have the you know. Re available to open. Uh, we'll go ahead and save all. Great. And now we'll be able to go to the Explorer pane here and you can see all the different folders that we can work with here. In this particular example, we'll just hop over into this file, which is, you know, it could view us the different statistics on this database. So in this example, if we just make a connection to our local host database for the script, um, and then we go ahead and execute it, we can see that this information, uh, you know, includes a lot of different information here. However, let's say that we wanted to remove a couple columns because it is a little bit too much information here. Um, so let's go ahead and remove the database ID. We go ahead and comment that out. Um, let's also do the database name. I'll add that out, and then let's try to rerun it. In this example, I could see that now we have the database ID and the name removed in this case. So now let's, you know, let's try to go ahead and save it. And as soon as we save this, we can see that the source control, um, you know, uh, does get adjusted here with this latest update. Um, and if we want to go ahead and uh, you know, add that change, so we've now added that uh, change there. And we can then go back into here and see the timeline. And you can now see that we have those stage changes updated in our source control. So this is one example of how you can leverage Tiger Toolbox. Um, to be able to, you know, have this full set of SQL scripts and also be able to source control so your team can go ahead and see the different comments you made. So yeah, that's just a quick demo of source control. And now to also kind of illustrate more ways that developers can leverage Azure Data Studio is that we do have this new experience, um, relatively new experience, 
um, involving SQL Notebook. So if we go ahead and open uh, one of our past notebooks, and we'll open this really basic one here, um, we fully support um, many different uh, you know, kernels out there, especially Python. Um, but in addition to that, Azure Data Studio is known for having a dedicated SQL kernel, as you can see captured here. So you can see that in this notebook, which is basically a step-by-step -step walkthrough for you to go ahead and connect um, your very first SQL server um, using Azure Data Studio. Um, and what's unique is that you get the syntax highlighting IntelliSense and results grid um, that you normally wouldn't expect in a Jupyter notebook where you would need to rely on uh, SQL magic. So for example, if we wanted to execute this specific query here, uh, we do need to go ahead and get that connection back to that database. And you can see that we get that nicely, ta nicely tabular data represented inside of this specific notebook. Um, and this is something that we continue to make investments in in Azure Data Studio in terms of figuring out how do we make this experience um, something that SQL uh, developers can truly love. Uh, we're adding all sorts of different languages here and can, uh, through Dot Interactive, we'll be able to support things like C-sharp, um, F-sharp, and you know, other languages in the future. So definitely something to explore further, especially since there is also notebook investments being made in Visual Studio Code. Um, but you know, for now, if you're planning to be working with you know, different databases, this SQL kernel does work with um, you know, SQL Server and other relational databases. So you can kind of expect um, those further investments in those experiences through our notebooks in the future. As I mentioned previously, the kind of future of notebooks is around having this deep language support as well as being able to support multiple languages. And this is something that you don't see in the rest of the open source ecosystem today. And so we are seeing this big bet being made by Microsoft in order to invest in what we call a polyglot or multi-language experience. Um, and basically what that means is you'd be you'll be able to have a single notebook that runs multiple languages uh, per cell. And so we currently have this experience, like we work with the VS Code team to contribute T-SQL into what we call .NET Interactive today. And this already is uh, available through Visual Studio Code. Um, so in order to get started with this experience, you'll first need to download the Jupyter extension for Visual Studio Code um, as seen in the extensions marketplace. And then next, you would also need to download the .NET Interactive extension, uh, which we can see right here. And once you have these two extensions installed, you can go ahead and just start using this Polyglot Notebooks. So let me go ahead here, minimize the extension marketplace. And here we are in our VS Code Notebook. As you can see, in a most recent update, we have a toolbar at the very top, very similar to Azure Data Studio, um, as well as a bunch of other options here, such as uh, language uh, pickers and things like that. And you know what's really great about this collaboration story amongst our no notebook teams is that a lot of the designs that we incorporate in Azure Data Studio influence the design in Visual Studio Code. And so what we have here is a very basic notebook. It kind of walks you through to connect to your very first SQL database and be able to execute a query against it. So first, after initializing the library here, we now have this uh, you know, .NET Interactive kernel that can execute SQL and make a connection to our local host database. So let's go ahead and run this. It should take a little bit of time just to uh, establish a connection. Looks like it took 4.8 seconds. And next, we'll go ahead and just run this query, select star from DBO customers. And let's just see what the result looks like. And bam, what you can see here is that you have T-SQL fully working and supported um, inside of a .NET Interactive Notebook. And you also have some options for different visualizations if you choose to display that information in that way. Now, the really key difference between uh, what we would like to also bring into Azure Data Studio, and this is coming soon, um, is that you can also run in different languages. 
So as you can see in the kind of language picker, oh, this is just lagging a little bit. My apologies. Okay, so we have our PowerShell query here. Oh, <laughs> it's a little bit of lag on my end. Um, oh, well, just a little bit. We want to see the language picker. Oh, okay. Well, this looks like a little bug, so we'll just need to report it and let the team know. But you can see down there that PowerShell is uh, supported for this specific cell. So if we go ahead and execute this cell, uh, it basically does the exact same thing that we were doing earlier, except in, it's using PowerShell instead of SQL. See, it only took 0.9 seconds, and we have the exact same table represented above. And, you know, Besides the little scrolling issues that we'll need to make sure is filed later, um, what you can see here is that if we were to run all the cells at the same time in this notebook, such as from here, um, you could be able to run each cell individually in a language of your choice. And so if you wanted to, you know, uh, the main languages supported today on Don Interactive include C Sharp, F Sharp, HTML, JavaScript, and SQL, um, and more languages are planning to be contributed. And the beauty of it is that Dot Interactive has such an extensible model so that you can have syntax highlighting, IntelliSense, um, and tabular data all represented um, and be able to, like, you know, it's kind of up to you as your, as customers to kind of let us know how we can continue to uh, bring more language support to Dot Interactive. So you can imagine that this support will be coming to Azure Data Studio very soon. Okay, great. Let's talk about why SQL projects are important, why we would want to use them with database development. And it all kind of comes down to SQL projects as the foundation of declarative database development. That's a, that's a concept that has a uh, complementary or contrasting concept of uh, migration-based development. But in declarative database development, you focus on the end state, the desired and a goal of what you want your database to look like. And then there's tooling along the way that helps manage the, the change or migration steps, but those can either be totally hands-off or somewhat managed by you um, throughout the process, but the, the, the changes themselves are calculated by the tooling. With the state-based development, because you're focusing on that end state, so you're writing just create statements um, there's no like worrying about where am I now? Do I need to write an alter? Because it's just kind of single format create statements, version control can be a lot easier to manage for a database or databases um, with declarative uh, database development. Along kind of the general application development cycle, you usually develop code. Um, if it's a compiled language, build the code, and then you publish your application artifacts. And with SQL projects, you have the same pathway, you have the same application development process as database developers with the, these tools. So the, the development of the T-SQL, that is the SQL projects, and we're going to talk about and take a look at the tools that you get to use to do that, um, kind of the application GUIs. And then um, once you run a build process, either in the application or in a CI CD pipeline, you get a DAC PAC file. A DAC PAC file is that database schema artifact. Um, so if you're uh, working with .NET, you get DLLs in. Uh, a SQL project, you get a DAC pack file, and that is that compiled database schema. Um, this can be used once or many times to publish to a live database. Um, this could be a test environment, this could be production. Um, you have this kind of continuous circle that you get to work through as a database developer, much similar to as uh, application developers. So this sounds great, you say. How do I work with SQL projects? The options for working with SQL projects are broader than they've ever been. Um, so SQL projects have been in Visual Studio for quite some time. 
Um, it's available as the data platform workload in Visual Studio 2019 and then upcoming with the Visual Studio 2022. So that's the, the SQL Server data tools. You can work with SQL projects right in Visual Studio. Now, Visual Studio is a, is a Windows only application, but there are cross platform options. There are two options for working with a SQL database projects right now. It's available in the stable branch of Azure Data Studio, as well as in Preview Now for VS Code. We'll take a look at both of those today. Um, it's going to be using the .NET Core SDK under the hood, so it's fully cross-platform. It's available on Azure Data Studio and VS Code for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. In this way, uh, any, any project you're working on, you are able to use SQL projects to work with your uh, database development. We're going to start by taking a look at kind of the uh, functionality that's available in Azure Data Studio, um, especially some of the things that leverages the more graphical interfaces of Azure Data Studio that Alan talked about earlier. So we're in Azure Data Studio now. We have the SQL Database Projects extension installed, and we're ready to start developing with the SQL project. Um, like many people in this instance, we already have a database out there. It's an application that exists. It's unsurprisingly the AdventureWorks database. And so I've connected to it in Object Explorer. Because I have this extension installed from the Object Explorer, I can create a new project from that database just right from that context menu. Um, so if you have an existing application that you want to start using SQL projects with, it can be a pretty straightforward process to um, start using SQL projects and kind of take all of those objects in the database and pull them into a SQL project. And so the main question that we have today is going to be what structure do we want these objects to automatically be arranged into? So, uh, for example, the AdventureWorks database has a couple different schemas, a sales schema, a DBO schema. Um, so there would be a first folder for that schema and then folders for the object types. Um, you could just have a single tiered folder structure where it's just tables, stored procedures, um, so on and so forth. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to stick, stick with the schema and object type folder structure and go ahead and create the um, project now. So what this, what this is going to do is it's going to extract each of the objects out of the database into individual SQL files. Um, Azure Data Studio, once it completes that, kind of refreshes the view so that you can um, render it out into the projects pane. We were on the connection dialog pane before. But because we have that SQL projects extension installed, there is a projects pane. And here we see the database project AdventureWorks. In each of these schema folders, for example, sales LT, we have different folders for the object types and then the tables. So we've got the table customer with the columns from it. And this is the declarative T-SQL create statement that you would be writing to build objects. Now, uh, in the kind of project explorer, we've got context menus for a lot of the primary actions, including adding new objects, build, publish, and schema compare. You can edit each of these scripts just by opening it up, making changes, and saving. Um, so for customer, I'm going to add a column for rewards account ID. It's going to be an int, and it can be null. So if I save this, I have changed the database project. I haven't changed the live database, just the database project. So one way that we can take a look at the difference between a database project and a live database or a live database and another database is through using the schema compare extension. This is available as an independent extension within Azure Data Studio, but it's also available integrated directly into SQL projects because it allows us to take that SQL project, have the extension build it, 
and then compare that SQL project to a live database. So I'm gonna compare the, the SQL project that we pulled out of AdventureWorks recently, made a, made a minor change to, with the, with the database that we uh, pulled it from. So we'll be able to see the difference in the uh, change that we made in adding the column to the customer table. This is an example of being able to detect either changes to a SQL project or changes to a live database. If someone else still had access to make changes to this database, it's, it's great to be able to capture those and um, add them back to the SQL project as is. A schema compare as an interface has the ability to uh, kind of not only show us the differences, so there was a scripting uh, modification that happens as part of the SQL package process, as well as the additional column down here in line 17. But we also have options for how schema compare runs. What, is it, what does it do so you can um, not only uh, do these scripting options, but you also can include and exclude specific object types. Um, so some of, some of these examples are not, uh, not doing schema compare on logins that might be specific to a, uh, a singular uh, database. As I mentioned, um, there are those options for scripting options. You can generate a script right from schema compare that says what, what does it need to happen to apply the changes or the difference between. Um, so this is going to be a full SQL CMD um, script here that will allow us to make that change. So let me see, there's our alter table add record, rewards account ID. We didn't have to write that. That's part of what comes out of schema compare the interface. So between schema compare and the ability to edit and uh, work with these SQL scripts in SQL projects in Azure Data Studio, we've got a nice foundation, but there are a few other uh, little little niceties that I want to detail in as well. The, the first are pre and post deployment scripts. Um, this is also a part of SSDT, uh, or Visual Studio's SQL Server data tools. And this allows us to add a script, for example, that after this whole model is applied to a, a database, do, do some extra things. This might be um, adding some static data, um, or it could be setting permissions on a few objects, the things that don't fit nicely into the SQL projects model. The target platform is an important concept for SQL projects. The target platform gives us what database engine is this project compiled against. For example, with each new version of SQL Server, you get new functionality. If you are building a project for a previous version of SQL Server, you don't want to accidentally be including um, functionality that's only available in SQL Server 2019. The, the uh, SQL project that we're working on right now um, has been set to SQL Server 2019. We'll go ahead and set it for Azure SQL Database as the target platform. But there are a number of different target platforms that you could select. And the last but not least um, item isn't available here. It's actually one of these little nodes that I've been skipping over for a while. And that's database references. One of the kind of common things that can happen is databases are big. There's a lot of objects in them. There could be um, hundreds of schemas. There could just be lots of objects. And what happens in those cases is you want to be able to make relationships either between different databases on the same server or even potentially the same database. So you want to have multiple DAC packs that comprise the same database. Um, and so you're able to do so by adding database references between different DAC packs. And so that could be 
all within a single workspace view within Azure Data Studio. You could have different projects for different parts of the database, or you could have them completely independent with database references between them um, and then build them together in a CI CD pipeline. So this certainly gives you a little bit more flexibility beyond just a single database project. Now, the one kind of almost most important thing that I didn't uh, mention at, at the outset of looking at Azure Data Studio is that the cross-platform SQL projects in VS Code and Azure Data Studio are currently compatible with projects in SQL Server, Data Tools, and Visual Studio. Um, so what, what this means is as a team working on SQL projects, you might have people working in Visual Studio, you might have people in Azure Data Studio, or you as a single person might want to be able to work in both places. And so you can take the project kind of back and forth um, at, this, at this point in time. That's kind of all for Azure Data Studio. I, we're going to flip over into Visual Studio and kind of take a, an early sneak peek at what that uh, interface looks like, how SQL projects interact with Visual Studio, and what, what, what does the future hold there for database projects. So in translating SQL projects from Azure Data Studio over to VS Code, there are going to be a lot of similarities. So I'm going to start off kind of focusing there on those, those kind of common interfaces that you can look forward to leveraging. In Azure Data Studio, uh, you've got the projects pane. Right now we can see our AdventureWorks project. We've got the Connection Explorer and then some of the other common tabs that are there by default, including the, the source control. Over in VS Code, the source control option is there as well as the file explorer and our server explorer, but that projects pane is what is fairly consistent between both places for sure. And that's gonna allow us to jump right into VS Code and kind of continue uh, demoing some of the functionality that's available in both places. In the case of AdventureWorks, we brought a database schema out of a live database and started our SQL project with all of those objects. Now, as we move forward over into VS Code, I'm going to kind of turn the example around and start a database project from scratch. You can do that in Azure Data Studio as well by using the plus button at the top of the projects pane. But we're gonna do that in VS Code and we're gonna use a SQL database project template. I'm gonna call it my new app DB. And I am going to place this a database project in the same folder that contains the AdventureWorks database project because I'd like to be able to have them both within this VS Code workspace. I'm gonna be working on both of them at the same time. I want them to be in the same source control repository. So I'm able to leverage that folder where I've got my AdventureWorks project. So I'm gonna place new AppDB right there as well. It immediately becomes visible. I mentioned the source control pane and it's already lighting up because it has noticed the SQL project file for new app DB. Before I commit that into source control, I do want to go ahead and add at least one object to the, uh, to the, the, uh, the new app DB SQL project. So I'm going to add a manufacturer table. with a couple columns. A couple columns to fill out just a, a small table. Just like over in Azure Data Studio, the, the right-click context menu is really consistent. We do have that build action. So from VS Code, whether you're on Windows or Mac OS or Linux, you can build the project right there to get the DAC pack file. Um, with the VS Code interface, you're able to incorporate a bunch of other extensions and you, you kind of then have access to the, the VS Code ecosystem. One VS Code ecosystem item that I wanted to, to call out that does uh, incorporate with SQL projects, 
after I commit these items to source control, I'm going to push to the remote. So now both, both of these SQL projects are in, in, stored in the remote repository um, on, on GitHub. Because of that, I have a uh, VS Code code space on GitHub that um, is connected to this repository. And in that code space, in my browser now, I have both of these SQL projects. I have the VS Code SQL projects extension. I am able to open up these SQL scripts. I can add a, another, um, another column for the phone number. I can save that. I can build the database project right from here in the browser. Um, the, this code space is running remotely. Um, code spaces are generally within uh, Linux based containers. And because this is cross platform, it's able to kind of seamlessly run the build right there from the browser. And the development price process can continue. Um, adding phone number column commit that into source control, push it out to the remote. And if myself or someone else on my team wanted to continue the development cycle, we could pull things from the remote. And after we complete that, we now in Visual Studio Code on our desktop have the phone number column that we added in the browser, in the code space, again, with that SQL projects extension. Um, so you've got uh, SQL projects in the, the, the bigger, broader world of VS Code. So potentially you were using SQL projects in Azure Data Studio or in uh, Visual Studio, and now you're building apps in VS Code, you can use SQL projects right there with that. We're really excited about the different integration opportunities that are uh, Coming, coming about for SQL projects in the, the world of VS Code. So we've so far been kind of going across a couple different interfaces um, to create writing T-SQL scripts and building the, the SQL projects to make sure that we're successfully getting a DAC pack. But then the, the question that that leads us to is we have a DAC pack, now what? I want this schema to go to a database. Before I talk too at length about the publish action, I want to peel back one quick layer under the hood of, you know, we, we talk about DAC packs, what are they, and then how, how is that getting taken to a database without totally destroying the database? So let's dive in to schema deployment getting that T-SQL code to a database engine. The DAC pack file that is that build artifact contains a full model of the schema. Um, if you're feeling particularly adventurous, you can change the file extension on a DAC pack to a zip and then open it up and you'll see some XML files that contain a lot of information about your database schema. The command line tool SQL package, or if you're using the DACFX um, library directly in a, a .NET uh, app, um, those, when they run a publish action, they are calculating the difference between a DAC pack and then a current database. So they're taking the schema model that's within a DAC pack and comparing it with a schema model in an actual database because that allows a calculated script to be created that would change one model into another. It's, it's a transformation and that's the migration. So while you got to focus on writing a SQL project that was state-based, the tooling in the middle is going to reconcile the differences there. Now I did mention that this can be something that's totally opaque and you don't, you know, you don't worry about what's gonna happen behind the scenes, but realistically some very complex things could be happening or you could be in a scenario where you want to be able to monitor and approve changes before they happen that's perfectly acceptable and something that's supported by using a generate script option um, that we'll see within the azure data studio interface and that is an option of sql package as well from the command line 
SQL package is a real in-depth command line interface to the DACFX framework. There's a huge depth of uh, capability there that we're not going to get to today, but I wanted to expose the kind of big four actions of SQL package. And that is for a DAC pack, a publish to a database engine or an extract from a database engine. We saw a model extract from a database engine when we pulled that SQL package, that SQL project from AdventureWorks to create that uh, project from an existing database. If you work in Azure SQL quite a bit, you may have done import or export actions that leverages SQL package DAC effects under the hood. You can use it directly to import and export a backpack. Now those two words, DAC pack and backpack are linguistically very similar, but ultimately there's a really big fundamental difference in that the DAC pack is a database schema, whereas a backpack is generally going to be the database schema plus any data contained within the database. So a backpack is going to be a more portable database backup. That's why the backpack is the artifact from import and export operations, while that DAC pack that focuses on a schema is the publish and extract operation. I mentioned that there's a significant depth of capability to SQL package, and because as a command line interface, dis the discovery of the different capabilities can oftentimes be done best by reading through some documentation. I did wanna highlight that the, the syntax itself is much more accessible if you go into the docs that we'll take a look at in a second. Because ultimately when you call SQL package, you're going to give it an action and then you're gonna use additional parameters. And you could be using, I kid you not, 20 to 30 parameters to fine tune the action that it's taking. Um, at like a minimum case, you could be using extract or publish with a source server to a target file and having it use uh, like Windows authentication. That would be like your really super base case. If you are reading about SQL package, especially in blogs or in examples, I did wanna give you a heads up that parameters have long form and short form names. The long form is a, a bit more descriptive and sometimes easier to read because source server name is a little bit more descriptive than SSN, but it can take up a lot of room um, either in the command line or potentially in like a pipeline automated environment. So. There are those two options. I am going to uh, run SQL package um, from the command line here after we look at the docs, but I wanted to highlight that you're gonna see me type out and struggle. I don't write SQL package commands every day. Most people don't because it's a command line interface. It's great for automating things. You write it once, you set it, and you try not to forget it completely, but it's, it's, it's a really great tool for automation that will see how, kind of how it ties in these DAC pack artifacts from SQL projects into being able to create a full development life cycle. So if we take a look at the SQL package docs, so SQL package, as I mentioned, has a couple different commands so there's extract, publish, export, and import, several other commands. But if we drill down into publish itself, there are parameters and properties. And like I mentioned, there's a lot of them. Um, so if you're working with SQL package, don't be shy about checking out the docs for all those different options. Um, because SQL package is a command line on top of the DACFX interface, we do our best to try to uh, make as many different properties available to adjust as potentially makes sense. So let's take a look at Azure Data Studio 
and let me grab my command line. So we're gonna we're gonna take a look at kind of the the two contrasting ways that you can be publishing your DAC pack or your SQL project. And so from Azure Data Studio, you've got a publish option. Now this publish option is gonna build the project and it's going to give you the option of whether or not you wanna output a script so you can see the changes as they happen or whether you want to publish directly. From the command line with SQL package, kind of at the most basic, kind of at the most basic, um, you're gonna be grabbing that DAC pack, you're gonna be setting the server and username and all those things. So let's get at it. The SQL package, I want my action to be publish, um, my target, server it's going to be that one right there so it is dps server.database.windows.net uh, the target database name is going to be adventure works lt um, i'm gonna use um SQL authentication. So my target user is going to be SQL admin and my target password is this long random string. Now I do need a source file. Um, and th this could be a DAC pack that you've reused again and again um, that could be located that you've downloaded, that kind of thing. Um, but in this scenario, I actually want to grab the DAC pack from our adventure work. So I've gone into the file explorer in Azure Data Studio and I'm going to copy the path to this DAC pack. So when I paste it in here, now we're able to run SQL package publish to that target server, username, password, and from that source file. So if I've typed this in correctly, well, I did target server, not target server name, and unfortunately it's all the way at the beginning. So what we'll do What I'm going to do is I'm going to copy paste it out. There we go. So now we are publishing to a database. And it's going to take about 30 seconds likely to run this deployment. So what it's doing is it's grabbing the DAC pack from AdventureWorks and it's publishing it to that server in Azure. And there we go, about 34 seconds. Not the most exciting thing, but it's a command line interface. You just want it to work, you want it to work regularly. Those are the things that you strive for. As I had up earlier in the Azure Data Studio interface, if we right click on a project, select publish, we can do the same sort of thing right from here. But instead of typing out that command, Azure Data Studio is gonna run the build to double check that the DAC pack is up to date and then it's going to kick off the publish as a task. And that should, again, take about 30 seconds to complete. So this is in contrast to this command here, running it from the, the UI. They each have their own like really specific use cases where they can be really helpful. 
the Azure Data Studio Publish is like a nice, quick, I just want to have this very specific, um, likely test environment that I'm deploying to. Whereas being able to use SQL package to really fine tune that and especially use it in CI CD pipelines to round out our development process, that's the kind of perfect case for it. Um, so let's now take a look at what taking a SQL project as it is code stored in a repository to uh, GitHub using a GitHub action and publishing it through through a, a pipeline, making that happen in that way. We're going to use SQL package. We're going to use SQL projects. We're kind of going to use everything that we've used so far um, to, to bring everything together there. Because SQL package is a cross-platform portable uh, application command line interface for deploying DAC packs, you do have a lot of options for uh, how you deploy your database schema out to your uh, database infrastructure. Uh, for the sake of the session and these examples, I'm going to focus on GitHub Actions, but there are uh, also a lot of resources available for doing these kinds of uh, actions within Azure DevOps as well. Um, so, so keep in mind that there is quite a bit of flexibility once you enter the world of CI, CD, and uh, SQL projects. For GitHub Actions kind of out of the box, there are two actions that you can combine to take your SQL project and its code to a DAC pack file and then take that DAC pack to an Azure SQL instance or a SQL server. Um, that action can also be used to just execute scripts directly um, if you have scripts generated or um, otherwise uh, like static data written up. What that looks like, um, so I'm going to start, I've got Azure Data Studio over on the right and VS Code over on the left. Um, in your file explorer, in both cases, there's going to be a, a .github folder. Um, now that, that GitHub and then nested within workflows is where GitHub actions definitions are stored. So for CICD, you tend to keep your code for the pipeline um, also in source control so that that definition is controlled and repeatable. And so with uh, this with this uh, CICD pipeline definition, um, it runs manually on command just to, in this instance, but you could have it run when a pull request is merged in. And in this case, the two primary steps are going to be the, the build action of our AdventureWorks SQL project. So MS build is being called on this AdventureWorks project. Um, and this is this is true for projects that you work on in Visual Studio or Azure Data Studio or VS Code or some combination thereof. Um, you, you don't you, you keep that compatibility with this MS build action. After this step, there is a DAC pack that is stored in the uh, bin release folder, and the SQL action is able to pick up that DAC pack. Um, and then deploy it. So I've got the DAC pack set there. And then there are two secrets, the SQL server name and connection string, username, password, all that stuff, um, that are in the pipeline. So in this case, we're able to keep the username and password that we saw earlier because I was running SQL package from the command line. We're able to keep that hidden in and out of source control by using the secrets within the GitHub repository. Um, the other, the other thing that I wanted to, to bring up about this action is that when we were looking at SQL package earlier, there were a bunch of parameters and properties. Um, and in, in this instance, we're able to use within this action here additional arguments to get past to SQL package. Um, because I'm deploying to an Azure SQL instance, I've got automatic index, index tuning turned on. And so there may be indexes on the database that have been created that aren't in my SQL project because I'm not regularly running schema compare. And so I want to leave those indexes alone. So I'm using a SQL package property for drop indexes not in source, and I'm setting that to false so that if there are additional indexes, they get left alone and not, not, not changed by our SQL package. This is what the CICD pipeline looks like in code. 
But if I pop over to GitHub, um, first of all, in settings under secrets is where you set these, uh, these values for the connection string uh, and then the server name. Um, to, to, again, keep those out of your, your code. You don't want those to be visible to others like, like I did earlier with the, the SQL package from the command line. Under actions, we can see that build deploy work, uh, workflow and a previous run that I did just a few minutes ago where the SQL project build occurs. So it runs MS build and we see a similar, uh, similar build succeeded message as we see each time when we build an either Azure Data Studio or VS Code. And then below that, we've got our Azure SQL deploy where it runs SQL package and publish. The, the secret values are uh, masked. And then there's my additional parameter for drop indexes not in source that's been passed in as well. And so we've got all these different, uh, all these different ways to get our SQL project and our DAC pack to, uh, to, to production. But in this way, it's automated. Um, even, if, even if I did use a script task instead of an Azure SQL deploy task where I had to manually write SQL package command, I would write it once and then I can run it whenever I want. And I can come back in here, select that workflow and run it again. And so you, you kind of have that automation. As far as CI CD goes, um, we don't have enough time today to kind of dive into all of the exciting possibilities. Uh, and, I, and I'm sure there are several other good sessions at this conference about that. But with GitHub Actions, especially, you can get kind of creative as to how do you want to fit your database deployment in with the rest of your application and infrastructure deployment. So whether you're taking the rest of your application code, whether it's .NET or Node.js, and also deploying it from linked pipelines, you can do that. Maybe the DAC packs themselves, you want to be able to archive them either into Azure Bob Storage or as GitHub releases. So we took the DAC pack and we directly published it. Maybe you just want to build it and store it. Or maybe you want to store it after you publish it. You can, you can certainly make sure that you've got access to the DAC packs for previous reasons. One, one reason why you might want to keep uh, previous DAC packs is you can use um, you can use those DAC packs again to run a deploy report. Uh, deploy report is uh, an XML formatted output that lets you know what changes would need to be made. So if you're comparing a previous DAC pack and a new DAC pack, you can get information about what would happen to your database without even touching your database, without even connecting to it. Um, you can output that XML into a new GitHub issue to review or for an approval step. And then last but certainly not least, um, the entire time today, we've been working either with a database ex that exists or a new SQL project that we never published. There wasn't a database out there for it. You can use uh, either AZ CLI or ARM templates or infrastructure as code like Terraform or Ansible in a pipeline to not only build and deploy your SQL project, but before you even do that, create those databases um, for you. So there are a couple different ways where you can extend your SQL project pipeline to take your code into live environments or for additional review by using pipelines to really interact with those DAC packs. So I hope I hope this has definitely piqued your interest into uh, what you can do with pipelines on top of SQL projects. But as we uh, start to wrap up today, I kind of wanted to hit back through some of the the main points that we talked about. Alan reviewed some of the great features that are available in Azure Data Studio and or in VS Code. Uh, so there's really those complementary feature sets that allows you to either choose one or the other or use both at appropriate times. Um, but at the end of the day, it's important that they're cross-platform tools that allow you to work 
where you are either already working or where you are most comfortable working because there are additional tasks that you can pick up there. When you're working with SQL projects in either Azure Data Studio or VS Code, you're able to develop the, the T-SQL that you need to create the schema that you're looking for, then run that build action, whether it's in Azure Data Studio or VS Code, or whether you've now connected into a CI CD pipeline like GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps that allows you to really build and then deploy your SQL projects to live databases. So you've got your full development cycle based in these uh, applications, either Azure Data Studio or VS Code, and you're ready to hit the ground running with SQL projects. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to taking your questions. Uh Thank you.